The 100% Wild Podcast is brought to you by Onyx Hunt, the nation's number one GPS hunting app. Download today in the Google Play and App Store. Hey everybody, Merry Christmas and welcome back to another edition of the Dury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. I am Tim Chelsvik. I'm Matt Dury. And this will be the probably the last episode of the year. Yeah, we should do something huge. Fireworks, mm. dancing we'll, girls. We should keep it short and sweet. The piano <laughs> solo. Get back to hunting. <laughs> <laughs> or do that. Because if I'm a betting man, neither one of us have killed a deer at this point. See, we're pre-filming these. but it's like back to the future. Yeah, I'm just guessing that <laughs> neither one of us will have killed a deer by then. <laughs> Tim, if you're listening to this right now, <laughs> listen to what Ben Rising says, who's our special guest today. Yeah. Do what he says and you yeah, will tag out. There's no, there's, there's, it's no uh, accident that Ben has killed a bunch of big deer over the years. The guy knows his stuff. He was with the Jury Outdoors group a long time ago, but here in the most recent years, he's got his own uh, show called Whitetail Edge. Of course, he runs, uh, I think, what, an outfitting business Wicked and Ridge. he's a logger and he's, this guy's all over the stays place. Stays busy. He stays busy. So, in without, fact, he's busy right now. Yeah, he's, he's on the road. Yeah, without further ado, Ben Rising, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Good. How's your season been? Oh, it's been pretty good so far. Killed two bucks. Um, still chasing my home state deer, though, Ohio. And I've still got a uh, buck tag for Illinois for muzzleloader. So I just finished up out there and passed some deer. But I was bow hunting during the muzzleloader uh, for my tag. But... I passed some, you know, 120s and stuff, but ended mm -hmm. up bumping the buck I was after right off the edge of the food source. He was bedded right close to it, which they do this time of year. Uh, he just happened to be bedded like 30 yards from the stand when we went to slip in when we got the right wind. And that ended that game real quick. Uh, <laughs> that's rough. That's, that's tough. tough. And, and it kind of ties in once we get to the question of the day. It's so we're talking about late season in general. And it just, it's one of those things where it, you got to have a certain mentality, first of all, because by this point, once the rut ends, and then in a lot of those states where the gun season's like mid November and, you know, late November, once that ends, you're like, man, all of a sudden, you're kind of in a panic. It's like, crap, out. Yeah. I am, I'm going to screw this thing up and not kill my deer. It's either a certain mentality or or you just have to be too stupid to quit. Yeah, well, both. <laughs> so, so Ben, you know, we need some advice. A couple of, you know, greenhorns here. We're asking for friends. Yeah, yeah, asking yeah. for a friend. What can a guy do here? And we'll, we'll get to the question of the day as well. But what are you doing? What are your tactics and tips? Well, um, I don't hunt mornings this time of year, really. I mean, unless you really know where a deer is coming back to bed, um, then that can be effective. So like, at, just for instance, once we bumped that deer out of his bed and, you know, we didn't even, we finished the hunt that night that well, cause he didn't really like, he wasn't freak freaked out, but he knew something was wrong. And I thought, well, maybe the next morning he'll just come right back to bed, you know, and we'll just be there waiting for him. So we did hunt the next morning. We didn't have him come back in, but on film, we got a, you know, a Pope and young eight point come in and bedded 15 yards from our tree stand. Uh, you know, so it's one of them secluded plots that are right tight to cover in food. And that's kind of where, you know, I don't typically hunt them plots until this time of year to where, you know, them deer bedded right there tight. It was gun season, obviously. And, you know, so you got to get close to them, but it's tough to do for sure. But that's, you know, one of my main tactics is hunting the evenings. You know, that's when they're going to be on their feet the most, you know, like right now we're in that good moon phase. Uh, where the deer are moving in the evenings pretty good, you know, um, and I think, you know, Mark and Terry talk about that in the deer cast as far as this month's, you know, phase yeah. of what their predictions were. And, you know, and if anybody's not following that, they're nuts because they're, they're usually very accurate. Um, but, and it's all hinging on weather too, you know, it can be subsided by the weather, but when you get the right moon phases with the weather, like right now, the moon's rising early up in the sky three o'clock, four o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, man, those are great days. I'm deer feeding early, you know, what time do you get out in a day like that? You know, here are the five days leading up to the full moon. What time do you go out in the late season? Um, typically I'm out there by one o'clock, one thirty, because I want to be in there and settled and ready. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes they can move, you know, they just, they're like people, you know, I mean, I don't think people realize just how much a deer is like us. 
you know, them crappy days where it's windy and rainy and you, know, you don't feel like going outside either. You know, well, the deer are kind of the same way. They subside their movement. They lay low. Then when you get those nice high pressure days where you get that sun coming out early in the day after a rain or something, they're feeling good. They're getting up on their feet. So I think you kind of have to base it on the day, but it's always better to be in there earlier than too late and bumping deer off your food. To, to folks who are watching right now and maybe wondering, Ben's lovely wife is driving the vehicle. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> yeah, I'm not driving. Yeah. <laughs> the, the video feed is, 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 is reversed, so it looks like Ben's on the driver's side of the vehicle and has this conversation. <laughs> he, he's a master Stipe of multi You boys like Mexico? <laughs> you boys like Mexico? <laughs> He's well, I, I, I jumped the gun here because we should probably just listen to the question of the day because it's going to get into all these. The, the guy's asking for these types of tips. Classic maturity. <laughs> the question of the day is brought to you by Cabela's and Bass Pro. Your adventure starts here. Hi, my name is Brent Denny, and I'm from Missouri, central Missouri. And I was curious as to what is the best archery tips for late season calls locations and all of that kind of stuff thank you you're so, welcome he, br he brings up a good point because there is a difference you, you know there's still a lot of late muzzleloader seasons like you said illinois still has one season left missouri you know that's i think starts like the 28th so there's late muzzleloader seasons that come mm -hmm. into play here but if you're trying to get within bow range and that's part of the mentality going into the late season it's like man i had a chance during gun season i know there's some guys you know you included that's just a bow guy but you know the guys that that use all weapons available you you think oh i got the gun season coming up then that go comes by and you're back with a bow. You're like, oh, okay, well, now I got to figure out how to get close enough to them. And Ben, you're alluding to that by staying close to their food source, you know, but what, what are some other tips that you would give when you got just archery tackle in hand to actually get within bow range of these animals after yeah, the gunshot, yeah, well, basically? <laughs> so one thing that I think this time of year, because, you know, these deer have been pressured all year, you know, they're getting hammered on. So you really have to step up your game as far as scent control. Like you really got to be on your game with that. Um, you have to hunt the right winds. Don't even risk it. Um, you know, so in stealth, getting in, getting out quietly, things like that. You know, that because the deer are so itchy right now. Like, you know, once you bump a deer off a spot like that, chances are it's going to take them a couple of days to come back to that spot because they're just so been bumped around, you know, through the gun seasons and things like that. Call wise, you know, he was saying something about calls. One thing I've noticed in my hunting ventures over the years is, you know, the big bucks are always the last ones to start really rutting and showing themselves good, but they're also the last ones to quit. I really feel this time of year <clears throat> is one of the best times to really kill a hammer. Um, because they're, they're very susceptible, susceptible to a call, like a doe bleat, you know, like if you see one off in a food plot or moving through the timber and, you know, you kind of give that little doe bleat, like a doe in heat or whatever, they're curious. They may want to come over and check you out just to, to kind of smell around and see if, you know, you're maybe a late doe that's still ready to breed. Um, cause they're not wanting to stop. I mean, they're still wanting to grind a little bit. Um, you know, and even buck grunts, you know, they're, they're coming out into the food sources and, you know, they've still are the dominant deer around. And, you know, if there's an available breeding session, they're going to take part in it. And especially this time of year, because the does are a lot less to be found that are in heat. So, but you're always getting those late does and the early, you know, the bonds that are coming into cycle now, you know, it's a really a, can be an effective time to get on a deer in that breeding situation using calls or light rattling. I just wouldn't get too aggressive, you know, feel the deer out, see how he's going to react to the calls. Um, you know, if you grunt at him a couple times and he flicks his tail, he's heard you back off, and let him do his thing. He'll decide whether he's going to come or not. Mm -hmm. What do you think about blind calling this time of year? Um, well, you know, when we're sitting with tags in our pockets and say, like, if you don't know exactly where that buck is at and you're in a situation where your wind, like you can cast your wind over a ravine or a creek or an open field where he's kind of got to really expose himself. 
I think it's a time that, you know, Hey man, we're getting down to the wire. It's like, you got to make some moves. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not a huge blind calling guy, but when it gets like this, I think sometimes you got to make those moves and maybe try something aggressive like that. Just don't do it so crazy that, you know, it doesn't sound normal. Sure. You know? What about, what about intrusion? If, you know, maybe you're getting a little desperate and you figure, you know, I've just got a few days left to hunt. I'm going to push in a little closer, a little farther, maybe into maybe closer to a, a bedding area or something. Does that have implications for the following year? Like you may, your season may be done now, but could you be doing damage to taking this particular buck or another mature buck next year by actions you take this season? You know, I don't think so because, you know, that's a long time frame. I mean, I don't think that buck's still going to associate in his mind that, oh man, last year I had this encounter with this guy in here trying to stick an arrow in me and I shouldn't mm -hmm. go back there. This, time. You know, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think if you're going to push it, now's the time to do it. But you, you got to really be careful pushing it because, you know, you're either going to mess it up. If you don't have the information you need as far as, you know, what us Drury family guys call MRI, most recent information, if you don't know that deer's bedded in there, then, you know, you know, you really got to kind of use your homework, you know, knowing if he's using that food source, if he's coming to that food source in daylight or using that acorn flat in daylight, he's not bedded far. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to use that information. If you're going by just going to some place that you have permission to hunt and you're just hoping you're going to lock into one, well, then I don't think you got anything to lose. You know, you need to go where you think the deer are going to be, where they're going to be feeding and try to, you know, get in between them or get on the food source on the edge and see what you can make happen. You can educate at aggression. And Tim smart about again, it. asking for a friend. Yeah. I just, <laughs> you know, people want to know this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, your name I is mean, Jim uh, Schmelzmick. And, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, and, and like, you know, Tim, like that buck I was just saying that we bumped off the food source. I knew that deer was in that, and I hadn't even had pictures of him in like nine days. Uh -huh. But that's how small his little zone had shrunk. <clears throat> I mean, he had been pressured by the neighbors. He hadn't had so much pressure from us, but he felt safe in there, you know, because, you know, I, me living in Ohio and then traveling to Illinois, I wasn't pressuring that deer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but it sucked because I bumped him. He was so comfortable by that food source that he was laying just off 20, 30 yards off of it. You know what I mean? Um, but it was the perfect spot too. He could lay up there on that little knob. He could have the wind hit him in the back. He could look over the valley and if anything went wrong, boom, he's gone. He could peel off either way of that little knob and he was out of there. Yeah. So I think if you can find those little spots where those deer are at, um, you know, you can make adjustments, but catching them coming back in the mornings is really hard because they're usually typically right now they're back to bed. The big mature bucks are back to bed before right at daylight. They're already in their general area where they want to be um, in the evenings. That's where I think you're going to shine. You know, you might might even do better to get in between them, you know, get a little aggressive, do a hanging hunt type situation. I think that works very well this time of year if you can do it quietly. Sure. So, you know, we typically don't hunt mornings in the late season, but when the moon phase, you know, like you know, we're getting ready to hit the full moon this week and then you know, the, the the preceding five days, do you ever, you know, even though it's a late season, it kind of goes against what we always feel and think about, would you go in and hunt those mornings, the you know, first five days after the full moon or not unless you were well, on something specifically? Yeah, I mean, so, okay, if you're getting, you know, we're getting down to the wire and, you know, you, you've got a tag in your pocket. Again, I think it bounces back to most recent information. If you've got that deer pegged and you know, he's using that food source in the evenings or where he's headed in the evenings, then I think you kind of need to stick to that because you can ruin your evening hunt. But, you know, when you've got the moon phase where, like you said, where it will kind of dictate a little bit better morning movement. Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe you can catch him coming back to bed later. It's just the hard part for me is taking that. I'm just so freaked out about always bumping my deer and moving them around that, you know, and getting them to my neighbors that it, I, I have a hard time hunting mornings this time of year, but sometimes you got to get aggressive. Like we've talked, you've only got a few days to fill that tag. 
sometimes you just got to make things happen and yeah. sometimes it pays off sometimes it doesn't but you know there's no doubt when you have the full moon situation that we all know that middle of the day movement like late morning and middle of the day movement is better than it is when it's dark mm-hmm. well and, and encountering a buck is just part of the story during late season we've all tried to come to full draw and it's 20 some degrees out and you've got your bulky winter clothes on and it's just a different ball game. So what tactics do you use to keep warm, to stay flexible, ready to draw when you get an opportunity? Yeah. I mean, one, you need quiet clothing. You know, you got to have stuff on that. You're not going to be sounding like, you know, dollar general bag drawing your bow. Um, but you know, hot hands are a must, I think, to keep yourself in good shape. You know, I, you know, everybody wants to be a tough guy, but hot hands, I buy stock in those things basically once it comes 20 degree weather and lower, because, you know, if you have one in each pocket, you're keeping your hands good and warm. And sometimes even I'll put one on my neck behind my hoodie. And that really helps keep things, you know, I mean, just staying comfortable, keeping your feet warm, whatever you got to do to stay warm and be comfortable in that stand, because you don't want to be so tight that you can't pull it off when it comes time you know typically everybody can pull their bow back but you still want to be relaxed yeah um you know and it's not the time of year to be trying to shoot 75 pounds that's for sure you know i think you need to have your setup to where you're comfortable you, you can pull it in any weather um Do shoot that, it man. whether you're sitting down or standing up you know that's one real important thing this time of year is being able to shoot from a sitting position if you get in that spot because Sometimes you don't have a lot of time to be able to, to grab your bow and stand up. And these deer are so on edge. They're so alert that every little thing is, you know, they're going to catch it. You know, at least a lot of the farms I hunt, that's how they are. Well, there's so much less canopy up, you know, if you're in a tree stand, oh. there's a lot less to, to stop you from being skylit yeah. from the ground. And, that, and I think that's how that deer got us coming into bed because... I didn't take into factor of the foliage because it is so open out there in Illinois now where I was at, where this deer was at, that where I was used to those deer bedding, I thought I could get in on them without them seeing me. And boy, was I ever wrong, you know, and it was just a rookie mistake. It was stupid on my part. You know, I should have thought about that more, but we all make those mistakes and you got to learn. It's a constant learning process. isn't it? And, and to your point, you're, you know, you're trying to make it happen. It's not like that's your home property that you just go the next day. You're there for a few days. You're yep. going to go to your best spot. You had the wind. What are you going to do? You know, unless yep. the only thing you could have possibly done is get in even earlier, but he was probably there since the sun came up. So what yeah, are you going to do? Right. You know? Yep. And I, like I said, I hadn't had pictures of him in like nine days, but I knew that if he was there, that's where he was going to be. I didn't know exactly sure that he was in there. But I was like, if he's here, this is where he is at. But it just was a testament of where I had my cameras, how such a small spot this deer was moving in this time of year. I mean, that, I think they just shrink their core so much that, you know, and he had all kinds of does around him to kind of keep guard to, you know, and I think that's the thing when you get the monarch, you know, the big buck. And I mean, we're talking a you know, this is a Boone and Crockett type deer. He's not a 200 inch deer or nothing, but he's definitely probably Boone. You know, when you get a mature animal like that, man, they just know how to use every little thing to their advantage. Yep. Mark says they're good at living. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they didn't get that size by being bad at it. Yeah. You know, no doubt. Hmm. So, well, Ben, uh, how do people get a hold of you, find your content if they want to? Uh, just white whitetailedge.com is our website our content is all going to mossy oak go now you know it's on youtube and other places but we are really uh you know trying hard to push everybody to mossy oak go um because and as you guys know with the the way the world's shaping up right now we could be kicked off of youtube and facebook any minute and as hunters and so we need to support our communities and the people that support us. And that's a, a platform like Mossy Oak Go or Carbon TV, things like that, that are for hunters. Do you not agree? Oh, agree a hundred percent. That's uh, one of the main reasons we built DeerCast. <laughs> you know, it's like to have our future in our hands and have a place. I, I say it, 
jokingly a safe place, you know, it's, it's kind yeah. of a funny, you won't we, get triggered. You won't get triggered there. That's, Actually, you will get triggered. Yeah. So it's made, it's made for hunters. It's exactly what uh, you're looking for. The type of content, the articles, the videos, the kills, all that stuff's there. So Mossy Oak goes another great example of it, but we, you can't have enough, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and you know, so we try to stick, I mean, we put it wherever we can put it right now. And that's the, the joy of having a digital platform, you know, and, you know, like us working together a little bit with DeerCast and, you know, like just, I don't know if people out there listening that don't know about your guys is kind of almost, it's almost like a social media platform on DeerCast where people can comment and comment on people's pictures and you guys have content there for them to view. I mean, that's great. You know I mean? And I, I think it's awesome because, you know, there's no doubt I am a Drury Outdoors baby. Basically I'm a, I'm a cha- a product of the Drury Outdoors team from years ago. You know, I mean, that's why me and Mark and your dad hit it off, you know, because, you know, I hunted like they did when we first met. And, you know, it was one of those things where, well, you know, back then it was a lot easier to get into this. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's not lie because I sure didn't get into it because I was good looking, <laughs> you know. Um, and it wasn't no, to make money. Don't say that. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, it was like. They were like, well, hey, you know, looks like you're killing some good deer. I'll never forget it. Me and Mel met him at the NWTF event. You know, she had, Mel's actually the one that got me in this because I, she bought me a video for my birthday and I watched it and I just fell in love with it, you know? And so I was like, wow, these guys are a lot like me, you know? And so then I met him at the NWTF event and we just kind of hit it off and they were like, well, if you want to invest into buying a camera, you know, we'll look at your footage and see how it works out. And, uh, how the I first year you ended up on the cover. <laughs> yeah. I killed a 184 that year and Mel Jeez. killed a, almost a 150. And Mark's like, well, I guess you're in. <laughs> 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 so, so you're telling like me there's a chance. <laughs> yeah. 13 years I was with you guys. Yeah. It I was, mean, it was great. And you, you laid down some monsters and obviously you're, you're steamrolling, you know, in your own ventures now and still laying them down. And mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool yeah. to see the evolution of, of how everything turned out. No doubt. Yeah. And you know, the cool thing is though, too, is that it wasn't like that because I decided to just do something a little different or had that opportunity that we're enemies or anything, you know, that's, nope. and that means a lot to me. You know I mean? It's, I consider Mark and Terry and you guys all just like family still. I mean, it's just one of those things when we see each other and, you know, we're always hugging and, you know, smiling and that's just how it should be. You know, we, and you know, just supporting each other. And I, I think that's great. So I appreciate that support from you guys and, you know, being able to do things like this with you and, you know, that's, that's awesome. And we appreciate yeah. that. And, uh, on that note, I think let's end it because that's as good as it's going to get a good compliment. <laughs> I'm going to say, let's stop it. We'll see you guys at ATA show and we'll get some of those hugs in. That's right. We don't hug Ben as tightly as we hug Mel though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, why would you? <laughs> ben gets a handshake. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, Ben, thanks for hopping in. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Have good, good luck on those bucks. Yeah. Yep, you too, man. You. Good luck in the late season here, bud. Okay. All right. I mean, Bye-bye. I'll tell my friend you said good luck. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Jim Schmalzvik? It's hard to pronounce. <laughs> Who knows? Like I don't think he's American. Something. That's all I know. Did <laughs> you get some kind of American name there, buddy? <laughs> so we went from the highest of the highs. Yeah. And now we're going to the wildlife word. Yeah. With the lowest of the lows. Let's Finish hit it. <laughs> <laughs> the wildlife word is atmospheric pressure. Well, I know. I know the words. <laughs> yeah. Nice job. <laughs> so it's also called barometric pressure. It's the amount of pressure exerted by the earth's atmosphere. The standard is 29.92 inches of mercury. For various reasons, deer like pressure above 30 inches with 30.20 or 30.4 uh, being the prime for buck movement. North winds tend to bring the highest atmospheric pressure. It's no wonder why we love those cold northerly winds. That's right, baby. I'm going to have one tomorrow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you should yeah. as well, actually. So, Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we'll get one on the weekend too because uh, I'm going to definitely be logging some stuff. Time it doesn't look good. That. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm hoping things because deer cast changes based on the weather forecast every hour. And so um, I just watch it. What offends me, if we're going to be offended by things, what offends me is when it says great and you're out there and it changes to good, even like, though yeah, good crap. is still good. I'm like, God 
Dang it, what changed? The same, and the then same I reaction. really like study. I go over to the deer cast section, I really study all the different variables. It's like, oh, was it oh, it was the cloud cover or was the wind speed died or what was it? Because it's not just pressure. I mean, I get I get a lot of comments or emails or whatever where people say, I think it's mostly based on the pressure. They're trying to crack the code. Yeah, right. It, right. it, it isn't that simple. I know that's a major factor. It is, mm-hmm. but it is not that simple. There's like 13 or 14 different variables in there. Depends on the phase of the season. The relative, yeah. It, there's a bunch of different things that come into play, but when, when I'm sitting there and it changes from great to good, it does make me really dive into it and be like, all right, I, I gotta, I gotta crack the code and decipher this. It, I, yeah. It's made me better at figuring it out. It really has. Well, and, and that's kind of what we hope. We hope it's an education because yeah. we we, it's not like we want to like secret this information away. We, we want people to become better hunters, yeah. but I ha- I've had the same reaction. And I guess the, the, the other alternative is that it just, stays the same, but we want it to reflect the yeah. actual condition. So that means and weather changes. And, yeah. and so, so we will get different forecasts. A lot of times you'll, you'll notice if you're really paying attention to it, you'll notice it changes after the fact. So your morning might go from a good to a great or a poor to a good or whatever it is, you know, and you're like, well, yeah, I didn't go out this morning. What happened? you know? Well, it's, it's using the data that came it's in. shifting from forecasted data to actual observed yeah. data. Yeah. So it, it's in there too. Go back and study it. it. It will help you understand why it, they're supposedly supposed to move or not move or whatever the and, case may be. And watch the videos that come up in, in your deer cast yeah. because they're, they're ranked by based on importance of for that, that, that particular time. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's frankly how I I'm learning the, the sauce. The times where I go through the videos, I find it to where it's like something stands out to me. That's like, all right, say it's like a super cloudy day. Mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, how, what, do marketary say cloud cover is going to do in this phase to me or say it's it's different based on it is super windy or whatever it is. It's like, all right, it's raining. What, what, you know, whatever snow, what's that effect? What effect will that have? And that's when I usually not to say I, I've listened to them talk about it for so long. I kind of have a general principle sure. of the whole idea yeah. here. But when something really stands out to me and, I, and I'm like, all right, that's going to affect me, but I don't know how, that's when I dive into those videos and, and learn something. It's, I, I mean, I find it fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And, uh, and hopefully it's a better use of our time because we have very minimal time to actually spend in the stand. Yeah. So you and make it count. I got it this morning. <laughs> I was getting ready. We were, Miranda and I were getting ready for work. She's like, when does deer season end? <laughs> like, I go, January I go, 15th, it's almost over. Year. It was like January 15th in Missouri. And she's like, not quick enough. <laughs> it's like, and I feel for, I have yeah, drawn this out all season. Like I should be tagged out, man. I should be in Missouri for my buck tag. I should be tagged out, but I have screwed it up and, and mm-hmm. I don't foresee it changing. I like, I foresee me needing to get to the muzzleloader season and I don't, you don't partake, but I sure will. <laughs> like I need the help. There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Not just professionally, but also on the home front too. Yeah. So okay. Done when when she said, said that this morning, the <laughs> only saving grace is that, you know, it gets dark so early and I can make it home by bath time. I skip the hell that is dinner time. <laughs> I don't make it into home for that, but I make it in home in time for bath. It bed. is a saving grace. Yeah. Yeah. An evening sit, you're done. Yeah. 4 35 o'clock. It takes me about an hour and 10 minutes to get home. Yeah. That's Traffic's died down by then. So that's nice. But yeah, that's here's my hoping only. tag out this look, which we're filled with. This is a pre film, pre taped. So this, you know, the live studio th- audience. The next three days here should be very good. Tomorrow specifically, the pressure, which you, I don't know if you probably can't go because you wasted all your vacation time. Not killing deer. <laughs> Not, yeah. Hey, well. <laughs> my, again, my fault. I, <laughs> no one to blame. Well, I'm going. <laughs> Let so, me know how it goes. <laughs> look, I thought Friday was going to be awesome. And it, 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 we saw some decent movement, but it wasn't quite the night I had hoped. Right. So now I don't, I don't have the right one to be in that tree stand. So I'm going to be kind of back on to the edge of this spot that I'm wanting to sit. And mm-hmm. I, I'm seriously thinking about taking a crossbow. I mean, because the deer I'm after just keeps coming out, yeah. out of my uh, kind of a fish. Would you range. bring both? Would you bring your I would. vertical? And I would do that. I, yeah. I think that's probably the best of both worlds, but the, it's yeah. that have to have it cocked in there and ready. And that's a lot of things. And besides our huge 
tins and packs with camera gear and yeah, this and that. a lot of extra it's stuff to manage. Stuff. But we and, are in a blind, so that that does help in that spot that I'm talking about. Yeah. So now, if I was hunting in that tree stand, and had the right wind, I would just take my vertical bow and mm-hmm. it it's, should be a 20, 20, 30 yard shot if he does what he's done every if, time we've if seen If some butts were candy and nuts, well, right? That's right, Tim. <laughs> then it would be Christmas. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the uh, the farm giveaway. I is think over. Has, uh, <laughs> has has shut down. So uh, so we're in the dark phase right now. <laughs> reaching Tough out times. to the uh, the individual who won. Yeah, uh, going to announce them here in them. a couple of weeks at the ATA yep, show. At ATA. Although, if you do need some hunting gear, the twelve giveaways of Christmas is up be, and rolling. Well, that should be about over too, Tim. <laughs> oh, we're still. I mean, when will this air? The this last week? A week after next. So the twenty. So the but the twenty third. The twelve giveaways of Christmas ends. So this will be right around then. And and we're giving away a prize every day. Yeah. You have to enter every day, and some pretty cool prizes in the mix. So if you need something, make sure you enter via Deercast. And never fear, because I'm working on something pretty sweet for 2020. Uh oh. I yeah. was starting to fill up with fear until you said that. I'm glad you did. <laughs> Well, it, I might have a couple. 365 cool giveaways. Of- yeah, one a day. I quit then. And we need to <laughs> sign up every day. <laughs> a couple thousand. People. Oh, awesome. All, All right. right. Well, I want to say one last thing. If this is the last podcast of the year, I want to thank everybody. This is the no most doubt. that we've ever done, the most consistently we've ever done the podcast. I think yep. we only missed maybe one week of the whole year, one or two tops. About that. Yeah. And uh, we just want to thank the viewers, the listeners. It's uh, It's pretty been pretty crazy to see where it started and where we are now. And it's thanks to people listening and viewing and and giving us the questions to go off of and, and some feedback, even if you, Call us, you know, Matt, the worst jury of the four, or Tim, just a me. bad host. Yeah, <laughs> all true. <laughs> this is what you get. So sorry, you get what you pay for. What do you think, Mark and Terry are going to be in the studio every day? They can't not be. so much. <laughs> you're stuck with me. <laughs> so, anyways, thank we want to say thank you. It. And if you're still grinding, there's a couple couple weeks left. If you're in the South, you probably got a month left. So God bless Keep you. Keep at it. All right. All right. Till next time. Safe uh, holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And we will see you in 2020. Don't shoot your eye out. (laughs) Peace. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV is brought to you by Onyx Hunt, the nation's number one GPS hunting app. 